focus in the morning session is on policy implementation. Uh, and the uh, question that I posed is, but will it work? So oftentimes, uh, you and the governments you work with come up with great new proposals for uh, policy uh, uh, innovations, uh, and then somehow the outcomes don't really match your objectives. Uh, you don't achieve your objectives. Uh, so think of the poor guy who was loading this donkey cart. What did he do wrong? What did he do wrong? Or did he do something wrong? Or is it the donkey's fault? <laughs> Not the donkey's fault? He forgot to load the donkey with some lead. <laughs> load the donkey with some lead. OK, so if you'd put lead, uh, like a lead belt around the donkey, that would have acted as a counterweight. It's an interesting proposal. I suspect you might get some opposition from the donkey on that. Uh, any other sorts of proposals? Yep. He overloaded the donkey's capacity. OK, so he overloaded the donkey's capacity. capacity and it's, this is probably even before the donkey got started, right? Uh, so not only is it uh, probably more than the donkey can pull, but it's also loaded in a way that's weighted towards the back that pulls him up. He'd probably have a little bit more success. I think the donkey would have gone a little farther if he'd uh, loaded more of the weight uh, towards uh, the beginning. So uh, clearly a problem in policy implementation, the uh, uh, person who was uh, trying to achieve the objective of moving all those uh, goods, uh, had good intentions, uh, but uh, ran into problems in the implementation process. So uh, remember we started talking off yesterday about a process-focused uh, uh, approach to policy analysis that says you need to think through not just the technical attributes uh, of your policy proposal, uh, but also uh, things that arise in the policy-making process. You need to think through, as Frank talked about, uh, state capacity and the quality uh, of governance are governments capable of doing the things that you want to do? You need to think through the role of stakeholders, both internal and uh, external, uh, and what that suggests about the political feasibility of uh, a program or project being adopted. <coughs> uh, today, this morning, we're going to talk about policy implementation. Uh, the challenges that can arise there. I'm going to try to uh, outline a series of sort of common things that can go wrong uh, in the policy implementation process and a set of warning signs that you can look for as you're designing a program to try to avoid those uh, kinds of uh, problems uh, that can arise, anticipate them, uh, and develop workarounds for them or say, well, you know, we really have to go another direction uh, because I don't think this will uh, work. Uh, in the second session today, we're going to be talking uh, about behavior change for individuals and firms, which is really an aspect of uh, the policy uh, implementation process, but is uh, very complicated, and so it, uh, we'll deal with it uh, uh, by itself. Uh, and then tomorrow morning, we're going to talk about constraints on uh, scaling up policy reforms. Uh, we're not going to have time to talk about building coalitions that last over time to uh, keep a policy uh, in place. But anyway, this is the, the causal model that I talked about that uh, you know you need to think in terms of when you're doing an analysis of any proposal, uh, sort of basic building blocks, thinking through your goals, what the problem is, uh, what some potential alternatives are, and then weigh them uh, through an economic analysis in terms of uh, their likely impact, how much they're going to cost, the distributional impacts, uh, but also these process-focused factors. Is it politically feasible? Can we uh, implement it? Can we get the kind of behavior change that we want? But all of which leading into a comprehensive uh, policy analysis to better inform uh, decision making. So let's start off with, uh, I'm talking about policy implementation. What do I mean by policy implementation? I mean uh, basically the decisions and activities that are required. Once you've set up the basic structure of a program, it isn't working yet, it isn't in place yet, but you've set up kind of the basic idea of the program uh, that are going to put it into effect, uh, keep it operating uh, at an acceptable level. Level, hopefully at a good level, uh, because most policies aren't self-implementing. Uh, that uh, just uh, saying we're going to uh, have a universal primary education program 
doesn't make it so. Uh, an example that I'll talk more about uh, in a minute. So what are some of the things that uh, can go wrong in the uh, policy implementation process? You can think of it, and I've got it as a linear model here, but it uh, often isn't uh, quite this linear. But what are some of the critical steps in policy implementation? Well, first you set up the structure uh, of the, the program. Uh, then you have to figure out what that basic structure means in terms of specific rules of how people are going to behave, who's going to have responsibility for what, uh, uh, converting it into a, uh, a set of specific rules and actions. You also need to provide resources for the program. What kinds of resources? Funding, uh, uh, people who have uh, skills, uh, so therefore uh, things like training, etc., uh, physical uh, capital and financial capital. Uh, oftentimes, programs require coordination across multiple agencies if they're going to be uh, effective. Uh, the agencies are working at cross purposes. The people who are delivering the program, what are often called program operators uh, or frontline workers, I'll talk more about this in a minute, uh, need to be brought on board. They need, you need to secure their cooperation uh, uh, if the program is to be a success. Uh, and lastly, you know, oftentimes there uh, needs to be uh, specific behavior change by uh, the ultimate target population, and we'll be talking more about uh, that in the session this afternoon. So uh, these kinds of implementation tasks are of several different types. Some of them are front-loaded. When you're uh, setting up uh, a new program or a new uh, uh, entity to deliver things. So this is the uh, headquarters of the Hyderabad Metropolitan Water Supply and Sewerage Board, obviously. Uh, you have to set up an administrative structure uh, and uh, procedures, infrastructure, uh, all those uh, sorts of uh, things uh, have to be set up. Uh, some things uh, take place at the headquarters level uh, and uh, have to be uh, performed what I call persistently and consistently over time. That is to say uh, that they have to uh, uh, not just be done once, but done over uh, a long period of time. For example, uh, uh, you have to uh, persuade or incentivize or coerce the customers of using our example from yesterday, the Hyderabad Metropolitan Water Supply and Sewerage Board, uh, uh, get them to pay their bills. You have to collect those bills uh, in uh, in a, an efficient manner. Uh, you have to perform um, maintenance on your existing infrastructure. Again, we saw yesterday with the Hyderabad uh, Water Board that uh, this is something they were uh, not doing in an exemplary fashion. Uh, and then there are other sorts of things that have to be done, uh, like delivering water uh, to neighborhoods that lack adequate infrastructure. Again, this is one of the, uh, uh, the water trucks that the, uh, the Hyderabad uh, Water Board uses. Uh, some things have to be done more intermittently uh, and in what you might call a lumpy fashion because they require a lot of resources over a limited period of time. So for example, bringing new dam projects uh, and pipelines on stream uh, to the, uh, the, the water board. Uh, so all of those things may require an intense period uh, of activity that uh, will require top management's uh, uh, most of their attention for several years, uh, and then uh, until the next water project comes along, it will be less intense. So a simplistic view of the policy implementation process sees it as being a fairly uh, linear process. The kind of standard model is governments make policy choices. Uh, so the choices are what government actually decides to do, its objectives. Uh, and then there are policy outputs, which is what government actually does. And, uh, what it doesn't do, and then policy outcomes are what actually happens. And we'd like to think that there is a straight relationship there, right, and a simple relationship. Government decides what it wants to do, it does it, and good things happen. Good things as defined by government, of course. But uh, in reality, uh, the world's a lot more complex than that. So let's take the example that I mentioned earlier of universal primary education. Let's say a government, say India's, uh, makes the policy choice that we're going to have uh, a uh, universal uh, primary education policy. Well, what are some of the outputs uh, that uh, are uh, involved with that? Uh, you know, they say that they want to 
uh, create school construction programs uh, and school feeding programs. They want to uh, hire new teachers and pay new teachers. Uh, but what can intervene between the policy choices uh, and the policy outputs? Well, things like fiscal constraints. There may be teacher shortages. There may be absenteeism uh, among teachers. Frank mentioned yesterday the studies that uh, have been done by uh, Duflo and Banerjee and others showing very high rates of teacher absenteeism uh, in India uh, because in part there isn't very good uh, monitoring of whether uh, the, the teachers are there. So you may not get the teacher output that you want uh, and things also interfere uh, in terms of achieving the policy outcomes you want. So there are opportunity costs for uh, school attendance, especially if parents believe uh, that the human capital that's being added uh, for their children isn't likely to have uh, a substantial payoff. Uh, kids who are more distant from school, again, are less likely to attend. Uh, poor health uh, in uh, poor countries, especially where uh, diarrheal diseases uh, are very common, uh, may also lower school attendance. So again, all of those things can interfere uh, with achieving the policy uh, outcomes you, you want. So clearly, if, you just, if a government just thinks about the policy choices and doesn't think about what happens after that, uh, there like, there's likely to be lots of slippage in terms of uh, achieving uh, its objectives. But my argument is that <clears throat> policy implementation rarely receives this kind of systematic attention uh, uh, that it should be given when policies are being developed. Well, why is that the case? Uh, one reason is for the politicians who are involved in creating programs, uh, they get credit for creating the problem, uh, for creating the program more than they do for uh, avoiding uh, implementation problems, especially if politicians think, well, I'm the minister of education now, but I'd really like to be the minister of finance, and maybe by the time all of these implementation problems arise, I will be the minister of finance or the minister of foreign affairs uh, or uh, something else. So they're uh, looking, in, uh, many of them are short-term oriented, uh, looking to get uh, credit for, uh, for those programs. Uh, sometimes uh, implementing agencies have a a uh, relatively limited role uh, in developing a program, de uh, developing uh, legislation. That uh, a politician comes and says, I've got this great idea, let's do it, uh, and or I'm going to do it, show me how I can do it uh, uh, the way I want. That politician may not want to hear all of the problems with uh, the, uh, the program. Uh, proposal, and uh, uh, the agency may feel a certain reluctance to say, no, we can't do that. You know? uh, the agency leadership probably wants to stay on the good side of politicians and say, no, we can't do that, or no, you're wrong, uh, isn't a very good uh, uh, way uh, to do that. So again, incentives to go along uh, with the politicians. Politicians also oftentimes see implementation as being somebody else's problem, okay? My role is to come up with great ideas that will move the needle in terms of uh, improving development or achieving uh, other outcomes we want. Implementation problems, that's somebody else's problem. That's not my problem. Uh, uh, so political executives, uh, both uh, the uh, uh, elected officials and uh, and agency officials may feel better to go along, as I said, I'll be uh, uh, gone before implementation uh, problems become visible. Uh, and then a fifth thing that I think interferes with uh, the use of implementation analysis in public policy uh, is that there is no single identifiable uh, methodology, no single profession that's involved in implementation analysis. Implementation analysis, as I'll suggest, involves lots of different activities, looking at lots of different things. Uh, and so nobody owns it, nobody claims it as this uh, is uh, my responsibility, uh, and so it tends to fall by the wayside. Uh, so what I'm gonna try to do is to give you some tools to think about analyzing implementation uh, more systematically, and in, particu in particular, identifying 
the, the kind of warning signs or red flags that there's likely to be a problem here that you should uh, be paying attention to. So what do I mean by implementation analysis? Uh, it's the identification of problems uh, that might arise uh, in carrying out a policy or uh, some set of proposed policy alternatives. Uh, things like poor coordination among agencies. Uh, that means that they're working uh, at cross purposes. Or resistance by the frontline workers, the people who are actually delivering the program. So people like the police, or teachers, or vaccination uh, uh, workers who, uh, for a variety of reasons that we'll talk about uh, later in this talk, may or uh, uh, resist programs. Uh, and of course, uh, there may be unanticipated responses by the program clientele as well, something we'll, we'll talk about later. So identify the warning signs, things that may go wrong, uh, and identify some strategies for uh, addressing those problems. So again, the, uh, the starting point for implementation analysis is most policies aren't self-implementing, uh, that they uh, do require complex uh, uh, delivery mechanisms. There are recurring problems and challenges. Uh, it's not like, oh, here's a problem in the school program, and it's unlike any other problem that anyone has ever seen before, so you couldn't really predict it. The problems uh, fit into a certain number of categories, uh, and they tend to recur over time. Uh, these kinds of challenges have several different routes, uh, uh, multiple routes, uh, many of those problems, uh, but there are some warning signs uh, that policymakers can use to predict implementation problems, and there are multiple strategies that policymakers uh, can use uh, to address those problems. So uh, we're also going to look at some, for some of the different strategies. They have advantages, they have disadvantages and limitations, so uh, we'll be looking uh, at, uh, at some of those and saying there really isn't any be single best strategy to deal with implementation problems. It really is going to depend very much uh, on the, the context you're facing. So you know, the, the last piece of advice is uh, try to uh, anticipate, anticipate uh, implementation problems and uh, address them in your policy design. So in other words, what you should not be doing is saying, oh yeah, there's this big implementation problem that's likely to arise in terms of coordinating these two agencies that have to work together, but they hate each other and they've never worked well together in the past. Uh, you know, you should anticipate that in your policy uh, uh, design and develop a workaround so that you're uh, not hit by it when it occurs. So what are some of these, like I said, recurrent challenges that are likely to arise uh, in policy uh, implementation? I'm going to talk about the first six of these uh, in this uh, session, and we'll be talking about uh, compliance and behavior change and uh, scaling up in uh, later sessions. So uh, the first uh, one that I'm going to be talking about is what you can call uh, interpretation issues. What do I mean by interpretation issues? I mean that in many cases, government creates a policy as sort of a broad umbrella, uh, and the details of that policy haven't been worked out. The priorities among different tasks, the responsibilities, if there are multiple implementers uh, who are involved, uh, were not clarified in the original program. So what are some of the uh, problems that may arise uh, in this kind of situation? Well, one is mission drift. So the, uh, the chief executive of the country may have had certain objectives that they want to achieve in uh, uh, putting a program uh, in place. Uh, but if there's vagueness about how the program is actually supposed to work, then the program implementers, whatever, whatever the, uh, the agency officials, these are at the, either at the top level or mid-level or even frontline uh, delivery, uh, may skew the program uh, so that it fits the interests of uh, themselves rather than government's uh, initial objectives. Sometimes it's just a problem of, well, we haven't worked out the details, and so there's delay until we figure out you know, what are we actually going to do here? What are our, uh, uh, what are our priorities? Uh, and uh, there may be uh, a conflict where you have particularly multiple agencies uh, over uh, the organizational mission. Does this really fit what we're trying to do in our uh, agency? Uh, 
So where do these things come from? What are the sort of the, the roots of these interpretation issues? Uh, in some cases, again, there are multiple roots. Uh, one is uh, governments may not be experienced uh, with uh, this kind of uh, program before, and so really don't know what the details are that have to be uh, worked out. But I'd say a more common problem, uh, particularly in democratic political systems, is that politicians realize that there are some divisive issues uh, in this program, uh, and they can't really agree. But they all see an incentive, particularly, uh, let's say, after there's been some sort of natural disaster. So, uh, you know, a, uh, a hurricane or something like that. Well, we have to do something now because you don't want to look like you're not responding to a national uh, disaster. But, uh, you know, who should get, if a lot of people's homes have been destroyed, who should get priority in terms of having their uh, uh, access uh, to funding, for example? Well, uh, you know, there may be disagreement over that. So, uh, but the, uh, uh, given the desire to get something done very quickly, there may be a, uh, uh, you know, a rush to uh, get a program in place without having uh, all those details uh, worked out. Sometimes <clears throat> uh, politicians like leaving the details uh, unfilled out because, uh, let's say, uh, who should be eligible for uh, a program of transfers to low-income people uh, in India? Uh, well. Politicians may like leaving that vague because that may allow them to channel resources uh, to their political constituencies uh, or to themselves. Uh, so all of these things may lead to vagueness uh, uh, in interpretation. So uh, uh, you know it's not uh, surprising that we see a lot of this occurring. So the question then is, uh, what are the, uh, the risk factors and kind of warning signs that you can look at if you're designing a new program and say, is this likely uh, to be a big issue uh, in this program? Well, you know, first thing you do is, as the program is coming uh, through, as the design is occurring, uh, if you see that a lot of tasks and priorities haven't been defined as the, the program is going through the, the policy formulation uh, process, or in particular, something that uh, a program that is uh, being put in place in response to a crisis or some sort of focusing event, all those sorts of things uh, are kind of risk factors uh, that uh, uh, mean you're likely to have some big uh, interpretation issues. So what are some strategies you can use to deal with uh, these kinds of interpretation issues? Well, if you're playing an advisory role, if you're the World Bank, for example, then uh, you know one certain one thing you can certainly do is suggest some clarifications to re, uh, resolve those interpretations. Try to make sure that those things are resolved before the program uh, is rolled out. Or if you're uh, not willing to suggest uh, uh, particular clarifications, you can at least point out the ambiguities to the politicians and say, or agency officials and say, look, you know, you really uh, need uh, to deal with these or you're going to face problems uh, down the road. Or you need to work these things out, or we're not going to fund this project because we think it's not going to work. So uh, again, a variety of things that can be done with interpretation issues. Second kind of challenge uh, that you see uh, recurring uh, in the implementation of programs is uh, coordination issues. Uh, many programs require coordination across agencies, across levels of government, say from a national government to uh, a subnational government down to a local level government. Uh, oftentimes there are NGOs that are involved as contractors, lots of different uh, moving pieces. So what are some of the problems that can arise? Well, all of you I'm sure are familiar with all of these problems. There can be stalemate and inaction. Uh, there can be shirking of more difficult tasks by some of the uh, agencies. There can be duplication, working at cross purposes. All of these are uh, very common problems in the developing world uh, and in the advanced industrial uh, uh, countries uh, as well. Well, uh, where do they come from? Uh, again, bureaucracies have their own interests. Uh, most policies cross jurisdictional lines. Agencies have uh, their own uh, issue priorities, and agency leaders and politicians may also be struggling over 
budgets, uh, over turf, that is to say control over a particular uh, policy sector, uh, and in some cases uh, struggling over rent-seeking opportunities, that they're uh, looking for opportunities to, to use uh, corruption, and so they want more control uh, to engage uh, in uh, more uh, rent-seeking. Well, I mean, there's some clear warning signs uh, of that coordination issues may be coming into play uh, whenever an agency crosses jurisdictional uh, or a program crosses jurisdictional uh, lines uh, or agency lines. Well, what do you do about uh, uh, addressing coordination issues? Well, this is easy to say and hard to do. Uh, that you simplify administration, right? You try to limit program conflicts by putting as much responsibility as you can uh, in a single uh, agency, so you don't have to get coordination across agencies. Of course, this leads to its own problems. You know, can lead to program siloing. You know, where the program, let's say, in the public health area, where the program to deal with disease X is being done by this group, and the program to deal with group with uh, disease Y is being done by another group, and they're not coordinating, and so you lose uh, the sort of. Uh, 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 ability to work uh, in economies of scale. So, you know, it, it's all a matter uh, of trade-offs. Uh, third sort of challenge uh, is resource and organizational capacity issues. So, um, what do implementing agencies need to have in order to make a program work uh, effectively? They need money, usually. Uh, they need uh, bureaucratic capacity, sort of overall strength, the things that uh, uh, Frank was uh, talking about. Uh, and they need legal authority, that is to say they have to have jurisdiction over an issue. Uh, and they also have to have some specific uh, expertise uh, in, in many cases, uh, uh, which you know, may be in technology, may be uh, 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 expertise in a particular area of public health. And if they don't, you have a problem. So think about the United States and healthcare.gov, uh, the federal marketplace that was supposed to allow people to sign up for uh, health insurance. Uh, the agency lacked the specific expertise to design that. It was also operating on a uh, very severe timeline, something I'll talk about uh, uh, in a minute. And uh, they had multiple contractors working together uh, and, and across purposes, and all of that obviously uh, uh, created uh, difficulties. So, uh, you know, uh, what's, uh, what are some of the, the problems that can arise? You know, you can fail to achieve your objectives, you can waste money, uh, and you can lose bureaucratic morale if the uh, uh, agency is seen as failing. So, in this case, this is a bridge in Minneapolis uh, that collapse. So uh, all sorts of things can go wrong if you don't have adequate resources. Uh, so why don't agencies have the resources to achieve the objectives uh, that, uh, that they uh, want to do? Well, sometimes they may not know the resources they need because they haven't dealt with a program before. Uh, but I'd say a more fundamental problem that you see over and over again is, and uh, let me know if there are any countries you've worked with where this isn't true, but in general, politicians like to spend, but they don't like to tax, right? They like handing things out to people. They don't like raising the revenue uh, that uh, is uh, uh, required to do it, and so uh, they tend to underfund programs. They also like to claim credit for addressing problems, uh, even if they don't know how to do it. So they may say to an agency, we need a solution uh, to this problem. The public is concerned about it. Uh, and uh, do something about it, and I'm not going to give you very much money to do it. Uh, OK, so what are some of the, uh, the warning signs? Well, uh, you know, if it's a new task uh, uh, the, that an agency is taking on, it may not be clear how much money is, it is uh, needed to resolve it. The agency is likely to lack uh, uh, the expertise. Uh, or if something is being scaled up dramatically. Again, uh, all those sorts of things are likely to lead to a situation